hari ini. weather. right there. Anyway, okay. here it is. We are officially in Ohio. building is Cincinnati's Union Station. goes up to Dayton and then goes on up to Toledo, Ohio. And just after Toledo is where you cross into Michigan and you can be in Detroit. You can leave Lexington and be in Detroit, Michigan in six hours and cross over into Windsor, Canada right there at Detroit. I don't know what that dome right there is. I wonder.
It's actually 629 instead of 729. Uh, but before we come into the formal presentation, I want to take this opportunity to first of all thank you and welcome all of you for coming. If you haven't gotten any food or drink, uh, please, anytime during the presentation, uh, help yourself. There's more coming right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, my name is Tom Koenig. I am the local spine tech representative here in Cincinnati, and we're very pleased to have with us a special group of people to help educate, teach, and share some information on inner body fusion techniques. First, I'd like to introduce Mary Haley. Oh, <laughs> Mary is with, our, uh, with us in our home office in Minneapolis. She says she's a recovering case manager for 15 years. <laughs> and is here to present a lot of the FDA, the regulatory, and a lot of the uh, insurance information. Dr. Brett Ferry, local orthopedic surgeon, as many of you may know, is here to present a lot of the clinical information, his perspectives on uh, the, the bioscience and some of the other information along those lines. And last but not least, a uh, patient of Dr. Ferry, Leslie Riggins, who will be telling her story for the end of the program. <laughs> So uh, please help yourself to any food and beverage, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with Mary. BAK cases, and I really didn't realize there would be quite so much interest, but I'm glad to see that there is. Uh, the reason that, of course, we do this fusion procedure uh, is for the treatment of low back pain uh, and predictive symptoms as well, uh, but it's most, most important, particularly for those of us that spend a lot of time in the operating room, realize it's a, very, it's a very small percent of people that we actually see and treat who wind up in the operating room uh, and need these sorts of procedures. Uh, the extent of back pain in our country is huge. There's over 9.2 million Americans that are impaired with low back pain. Uh, 2.4 million are disabled. And you can see the costs to our country are staggering. It's estimated 16 to $50 billion a year. And there's still over a quarter million operations performed each year uh, to treat this condition. The vast majority of patients that, that we see in our offices every day uh, with low back pain improve uh, without surgery. In fact, less than 2% eventually come to surgery. So it's a very small percentage of people that we're seeing in the operating room uh, that have a condition that requires uh, surgery. It's also important that for us to realize that there are many other things that cause low back pain besides the discs, not simply just the discs or arthritis, the things that you see again over and over again that we're operating on. There's a host of conditions that can cause low back pain. The treating someone with effusion, uh, even with the BAK, is not going to help their pain. For example, uh, referred pain. This is a gentleman with back pain and pain going into his leg. This is an example of which for those of you that have an orthopedic background, can appreciate and see he's had multiple laminectomies and then to say, well, do I need a fusion? Uh, I've had these surgeries and I continue to have pain uh, that goes into my left groin. It's hard to see, but the person has a very arthritic tip. So again, there are many, many reasons uh, for back pain, uh, tumors, etc. What we'll be talking about today are two specific conditions uh, that failure of conservative care are conditions that can be treated with laparoscopic uh, BAK insertion. One of the common conditions that we treat uh, that is very conservative here, laparoscopic BAK is the front of the light. You see the cracks right here, there should be an intact ring in the patient with the CT scan, the fetal body here, the spinal canal here, the spinal light is a stress fracture, generally developed in children, actually in adolescents. Uh, the vast majority of patients get better. But those that do not get better are candidates for fusion. Spondylolisthesis is when this vertebra actually slides forward uh, on the vertebra below. Go over a couple other conditions that can cause back pain that they can treat with laparoscopic fusion. Arthritis of the set joint uh, can be treated with very conservative care with laparoscopic fusion. Or the most common cause is generation of the disc. Uh, we do know that generative can cause pain. The key, though, in preventing patients uh, from re even requiring these surgeries uh, is prevention, uh, strengthening of the abdominal muscles, prevention of smoking, proper lifting techniques. Uh, we should try 
everything we do to actually keep the patients out of the operating room. By prevention, and then if the failure of prevention, the patients actually do develop back uh, disorders, uh, we only consider surgery if there's a progressive neurologic deficit or the failure of extensive surgical care against inflammatory medicines, non steroidal steroidal, muscle relaxers, physical therapy. Uh, and again, with these treatments and time, 98% of people get better. We're talking about a small group of people. Those that don't get better are the ones that we do take the surgery. The surgical procedures uh, can be a simple decompression if the main symptom is that of pinched nerve, for example, herniated disc or spinal stenosis. And the vast majority of those patients do not need to have fusion. For those patients, though, that do have uh, the conditions that we discussed earlier, the spinal diseases, degenerative disc disease, who have back pain as their primary component, perhaps refer pain to the side, surgery to just take pressure off the nerve is not going to be effective and have to consider a fusion. What the fusion does, as many of you are aware, is to eliminate motion between the segment that the passer is moving, the cheap motion uh, that not only causes the back pain, but causes the disorder in the foot pain. There's a host of different techniques, as many of you, again, that are familiar with or in the operating room are aware of to achieve the fusion. We can just use simple bone grafts, which is the, the, the oldest technique, uh, where you go in and scrape the bone, take bone from generally the iliac crest, and lay it over the area that you just fused. Uh, the advantage is this is probably the cheapest way to do a fusion, because uh, you're not spending any money on instrumentation. Uh, it can be done through an either an anterior or posterior approach, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And afterwards, put the patient into a brace to try to decrease their motion. Unfortunately, these patients have a lower fusion rate, um, and so they have a higher incidence of requiring additional operations. Alternatively, then, as uh, people have said, well, what can we do to increase our rate of our fusion? Well, it's similar to, again, if we're looking at the analogy of healing a brace, well, if you just, if you don't set up a fracture, it's not going to heal if you don't immobilize it. The way you immobilize it best uh, is you put an instrumentation. For example, again, those are your points of peak, the broken femurs that we've used in the next couple of people here at the university, put in a rod. Most people have developed, as you know, rods for the back, rods, hooks, and screws. Uh, right, the most common one that we've seen probably in the United States, still see now, is the pedicle screws that do a very good job of immobilizing the spine. And what they do is they hold the vertebrae together as the bones are trying to fuse together. They are a big step forward from simple non-instrument fusion because the fusion rates are higher. Um, unfortunately, you know, it does add to the expenses but it does decrease the risk of reoperation. Uh, there are complications with this sort of surgery. Uh, you can see that when you go in from behind, it does require that you expose a fair amount of the spine uh, and stretch the muscles. And that's why patients have a lot of pain generally after these procedures to stretch the muscles so much. To put in these screws at the proper orientation to prevent them from going into the nerve root. I did a study when I was fellow at Boston uh, on blood loss. And this adding pedicle screws to the case, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I studied hundreds of patients, increased the blood loss by several hundred species. Um, so it's higher damage as you stretch the muscles in the back associated with longer pain uh, and more post operative pain. The other criticism of doing surgery posterior that's going into the back is that if 80% of the forces are traveling through the front of the spine, and only 20% are traveling through the back of the spine, we're kind of at a disadvantage because this is the area that we're trying to achieve our fusion, and in fact, the majority of the forces are going through the front of the spine. Pedicle screws somewhat help with this because they do extend into the front of the spine, but again, we're trying to bypass an area. Again, putting ourselves at a little bit of a disadvantage. So people said, well, what we need to do is we should go where the problem is. If 80% of the forces are going through this part of the, part of the spine, let's do the fusion in front. And that's anterior spinal fusion. As many have seen, in general, this has required a large flank incision, uh, which requires cutting through the external oblique, the 
internal light which travels 90 degrees to this, or actually 180 degrees to this, um, but will then have to be cut. So you've got your external forcing one direction, your internal light forcing the other, and the transverse is going across this way. So you can't do a muscle twisting approach to get injury into the spinal uh, area in a retroperitoneal approach. Similarly, a transperitoneal approach is being required extensive exposure. The other disadvantage is that if you go in and you just take the disc out and insert bone graft, uh, it's, we're back to our non-instrument infusion, we have a fairly significant failure rate, uh, an unsuccessful infusion for osteoarthrosis. So then a number of people have said, well, what we need to do is we should do both. And that's the anterior posterior spinal infusion. So we went posteriorly, we put in our rod to get stability, put bone in the back of the spine, We'll also put bone between the vertebra in the front of the spine, and then we'll cover both our bases. Initially, uh, these procedures were done as a stage uh, procedure, where a patient would come in, have an anterior procedure, then two weeks later have a posterior procedure. Uh, it's funny, I, I talked to someone this week who was in their 60s, who said originally it was a three-stage procedure. Uh, for longer fusions, they would come in and just expose a few of the vertebra posteriorly, put the bone graft in and they thought that was so much stress to the patient that they would wait a week later and then come in and reopen them up posteriorly, add a few more vertebrae, close them up, and two weeks later do them anteriorly. Uh, well now, we're more sophisticated in anterior posterior surgeries are generally done the same day. Uh, the same setting we found that the overall complication rate is lower. Uh, initially, people thought that was too much stress for the patient to do an anterior the PAK, uh, which compares to a PSRH, which you may be familiar with, which are the rods and pedicle screws, and a bone graft based on the pain and rigidity of the body. This is just comparing an intact spine, the rigidity you have from the intact spine, to one of the BAK devices, which is also increased the lateral bending stiffness by almost 100%. And then when you add the second one, you can see increased the bending stiffness by another 400 or more percent. So it really does a good job of mobilizing the spine. The success rates with the BAK case has been quite high. In fact, the fusion rates reported with this device have been higher than any other form of spinal instrumentation. You can see that the fusion rate here is a 98% fusion rate at a three-year follow-up at one level, 100% at a two-level anterior fusion at a three-year follow-up. Similarly, patients experience a marked decrease of their pain generally in the first three months because you've got this rigid immobilization that's occurring by the device before the fusion even occurs. And then you can see they continue to improve though uh, over the next several months to even years. VAK has been uh, compared to other types of instrument fusion, and you can see that the fusion rate is higher, the pain improvement rate is higher, uh, the functional improvement that is reported by the patient is higher, it's decreased hospital space, and this is with the open VAK uh, procedure, reduced free operation rate from 4% compared to 20 to 30 percent with other instrumented techniques, and patients with a significant number of them are returning to work with a happy uh, lifestyle. I've been surprised that I've had a number of patients uh, that I've, I've performed all sorts of spinal instrumentation, medical screws, rod hooks, uh, non-instrumented fusions, anteriors, anterior posteriors, and BAK. But I've had more patients come in in the early post-operative period with the BAK, stating it's been actually Lives, they've recovered so much quicker. So then, what uh, Dr. Hacker did was he said, Let's compare the BAK device to those patients who are going to anterior posterior fusion, or the 360s, as it's sometimes called. And with the, the BAK, he was able to show that the hospital stays were reduced by 34%, the operative times were cut in half, blood loss was decreased by 57%, and this is the number that shows that the reflects the return to work is the disability pay was decreased by 38% because the patients are able to go back to work sooner. And that's graft pain. As you can imagine, uh, and those of you who have been involved with these procedures know, that you only have to remove as much cantellus bone as it takes to fill the cage, as opposed to a traditional anterior surgery where you take the tricortical iliac crest graft. So the posterior procedures where you have to harvest abundant graft, you know, the theory is always said you can't have too much bone graft. Well, unfortunately, a number of those patients end up with donor site pain. In fact, that's often what they complain about for the moment. Uh, they significantly reduce the, the, the donor site related complications. It showed a significant decrease, uh, or a 
again, if you kind of disability differences, a little less, a little cost is significantly less, in addition to the patient, the patient returns quicker and less pain, of course, the most important. Now, if only you could get one of these devices in without doing such a large incision, then you might really see patients recovering quicker. Uh, and that's what laparoscopic surgery is all about. What it involves is we do it, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the surgery where we do it through portals. The portals range anywhere from 5 millimeters in size to 18 millimeters in size. And on a typical case that we'll do laparoscopically, we'll insert in a patient's belly button or like a 10 millimeter portal. And through that portal, we insert a blunt probe, which actually goes in and separates the muscles. As opposed to this procedure where you have to cut the muscles, the blunt probe, and the ones that are made here in the world made in Ethicon, actually goes in and separates the muscle fibers without cutting them. But then that gives you an avenue to get inside the abdominal space, and through that you insert a scope, a telescope. Uh, and then we can see inside the abdomen then. And then we insert over the pubic bone an 18 millimeter portal, uh, very similar to what was just described as a 10 millimeter. And that's our working portal. That's where we're able to take the disc out and, and do fusion. And then we do either one or two other five millimeter portals uh, to insert instruments that are smaller than the size of the tent and to manipulate uh, things which we'll see here in a minute, like bowels. Uh, so the patients have a lot less post operative pain. They're not cutting any muscle. Uh, the incisions are much more cosmetically perceptible because you have four little dabbles so that you have a jerry strip on the knee instead of in the large plank incision. So patients are waking up and not requiring two days off. Uh, they're getting out of bed either the same day of their surgery or the next morning. Uh, our patients now are going home the next morning. In fact, I think the ones that we're going to start doing in the afternoon will be doing under a 23-hour hold, which is pretty much unheard of for some fusion. So the advantages of laparoscopic surgery are being minimally invasive. The most important part is minimally with patient care. If I were to have a piece of procedure done now, I would want it done laparoscopic. Uh, it reduces hospital stays, and our patients are now going home the next morning. It's going to be, as we'll talk about a little bit later, um, two years or so from now when we have the ability to use bone graft, which is genetically engineered, which doesn't have HIV risk, which does have a high success rate, and we'll be surprised if we're doing the same day surgery. Patients will come in, have a same day fusion at home. Uh, quick return to work, I now have two patients that return to work following the final fusion of the VA cage wise in one week. Um, and <coughs> question certainly the decreased operative and decreased hospital costs. Uh, these procedures do require two surgeries, so that does decrease the cost. You have the cost of the VA cage wise and the cost of the cost of the trope bars that you're inserting. So that, that does decrease the cost. So they have a lower operative uh, reoperative rate return to work more quickly. So I think the cost pretty much balanced out, but do go in the favor of laparoscopic surgery. And in general, there are minimal blood loss associated with these procedures. In fact, we've no longer been having patients donate a college of blood before surgery. Most of most years, we've always had to donate two or three units of blood. So the differences are smaller incisions, and their muscle splitting, is not cutting any muscle. So there's minimal tissue damage, but there is a learning curve mentioned it does require that the two surgeons, the spinal surgeon and a general or vascular surgeon. Uh, we're fortunate that the spine tech is there frequently in these cases. The operative staff where I work is all very knowledgeable and so it's and that's very helpful to keep the case from well smoothly. These are the instruments that you use. This is the one that goes through the 18 millimeter portal. Uh, you can see that the are like drill bits in the end, uh, so it needs to be extremely careful. That's the technical part of the laparoscopic procedures. Uh, we'll see a couple slides in a little bit to show you how close to get these two things like celiac veins and arteries uh, and bowel and bladder. So it does require uh, training to do this. Uh, we're fortunate here in Cincinnati that that's what we're here. Like this past week, and I was involved in training surgeons from other states. Uh, to learn how to do these types of 
with Ethicon and applying to parts of these courses. Uh, so physicians have a chance to learn from other physicians. Uh, we've had a chance to do it in several of these cases. I've now done 86 laparoscopic uh, fusions. And they also have a chance to practice a, uh, an animal model. So for those of you who aren't familiar again, with laparoscopic surgery, the surgeon uh, actually isn't even looking at the patient for the most part. We have these monitors, which I apologize you can't see very well, but we will watch the television screen the surgeries that we're doing. The advantage of that is at the end of the light of the telescope, uh, you have a lot of illumination that makes the abdomen very bright. It also gives you 15 times the magnification, so it's like doing microscopic surgery uh, by looking at these monitors. These are a couple of intra-op photos and demonstrating the steps that you go through. drill bits that you can, you can win bit and drill a hole in the disc. And after you drill a hole in the disc, you remove the disc material that you can get you through that hole, and then you insert a extracting device. So where you have some you have someone who has a disc that's very generous. Uh, I've done this for patients who have leg pain as well because the nervous is somewhat depressed by just the narrow exiting area of the spine called the foramen. But these serially increased extracting plugs by one millimeter size, uh, you can separate the vertebra before the normal disc space height uh, to get the pressure off the nerve roots. And this is an example of one of those plugs that we do that with. And we do this under fluoroscopy as well as uh, looking at the screen. This is an example of one of the plugs that are in the left of the place. And you put a comparable plug right here. And this would be where the cage goes. And this is an example of what it looks like after you take one of the plugs out. This would be, uh, I guess this is an L5 case would be the L5 or T body, which would be the top of the S1 or T body, so you remove a little bit of the bone. And this is an example of when the cage has been in place. Uh, you can see some of the bone grafts in here, and we'll go back to some of the bone grafts around here. <coughs> this is an x-ray, a lateral x-ray demonstrating an L5 or T body, a distraction of the disc space, and the cage has been placed.
highlighting the importance of deploying this one place and getting training in a particular language. Um, and you're using drill bit sharp instruments that are, are handled without here. So you have to handle out here, any movement that you make outside the patient's abdomen is magnified down near the iliac vein. Here's one of our cases right here. The patient's left iliac vein. Those of you who, for those of you who aren't familiar with a structure like this, this thing around your thumb is tissue paper, paper thin, and one little nick that uh, results in tremendous bleeding. So it's important in these cases that you get the training, but also that you uh, go through proper progressive planning. Uh, companies provide templates to give an example of where to put your cable, the size cable to serve. We have extended the laparoscopic uh, procedure since uh, through the retroperitoneal approach that we were talking about. Uh, I've actually performed uh, 13 uh, of these rods and now putting in CD rods and screws laparoscopically. Uh, example of a patient who put a CD rod from L3 to L5. Uh, for patients who are another patient who's not a candidate for a BAK device, uh, we've been doing laparoscopically as a patient who has a grade 3 or 4 spinal lobe.
terms of uh, bone density or something like that in terms of candidacy for a CHA? That's an excellent question. And I think it can be, you can look at that in several different ways. I mean, in my mind, one of the surgeons at this course this past weekend asked to present a case uh, of a lady who was in her upper 70s, had an osteoporosis compression fracture, and T12 had some loss of compression of the core. He wanted to know if he could do this case orthoscopically. Um, as you know, when people have osteoporosis, it doesn't matter what you put in, rod, screw, hook. Uh, I've been cases where we've injected enough of the back blades into the people's body to increase the strength of our screws. Uh, they're still associated with high risk of instrumentation failure and cutoff. Uh, we have had one patient uh, who I believe has osteoporosis. She's not in test for it yet. She's great fresh post op. That when we put the cage in, I didn't feel comfortable that it was in there securely. I actually removed it during the same procedure because her bones were soft. And the whole osteoporosis question in fusion is someone who has osteoporosis, will they fuse? And I, I don't think the jury is quite decided on that. I mean, there are certainly a number of patients who have osteoporosis and continue to fuse, um, but I don't think this device addresses it is the perfect device for those cases. I would I think the oldest patient I know I've been patients in their sixties uh, with BAK. But I would be hesitant if I'm in there and I think the case would be not a very good purchase from us to probably go in in that case they did I remove it. But then it would be extruded into the receiver R for the aorta really um. Is there any benefit to using Proaxion by itself or regular bone graft by itself or mixing it? I think there'll be in the future even more benefit. If you have to obtain you know, any oleic press graft, uh, I think it's probably not going to change the patient's post op recovery. So you have to make a decision on the oleic press and then expose that during the assumption of the bone, whether you remove a little bit. Half a cage or not a cage, I wouldn't think it makes a significant difference. Uh, I think the ideal thing would be that you didn't have to obtain a graft at all. And I think it depends on people's comfort level as to whether or not they feel the bone graft substitutes now uh, are adequate to obtain a fusion. Uh, my own personal feeling is it's not yet, but I would mention I'm extremely conservative. I've always done 80 some laparoscopic fusions that may not be considered conservative. Um, I tend to Address each patient like I would treat myself. What would I recommend to myself? Even though this is minimally invasive surgery, I wouldn't go through it with a questionable bone graft material myself because it may require revision surgery. Um, I can tell you that in the course, I've talked to people that are doing things like that. There are a few people who are taking the reamings, and I was surprised to hear from the reamers, and then using that, adding that into the cage.
follow up on these patients for 10 years. It's not, you know, something that they have to years ago or it's done. We just submitted our scoring five-year data, and it's not published yet. The FDA is reviewing it. The reoperation rate has stayed at 4.5%, which is pretty significant. When you take a look at comparison to that 20 to 30% rate, where I would see it in my practice was, okay, patient may have done better, then pretty soon you're back in, either removing hardware, back in for the <coughs> back in levels above and below. You know, do we know what's going to happen long term 10 years out? No, obviously not. But what we have are the four and five year data right now that's showing that we operate at the four, four and a half percent. Where we received our approval is from L2 to S1. We're approved for one and two levels. There are three and four level cases being done. It's not considered off label use, but we don't have the data to support that. Um, I'm aware of a couple of three level cases that were done in California, and I'm trying to follow up on those to see what the outcomes are. Because that, to me, obviously, like I said, is the real key to this is what the outcomes are and how that patient does. But what I want to go through, I'm going to hand around a bone model. And as Dr. Free was saying, you distract, he was talking about those distraction plugs. As you can see, when you go in, what you do is you restore it to that pre-disease type. You go in, you template from that patient's x-ray, look at that level above or below to see what it would normally be. Then you distract it. By doing that, you're opening up that area. You also tense the annulus all the way around it. So you have immediate stability in there. The one thing with the degenerative disc disease when you have that movement going on with bone on bone, by doing this, you get immediate stability. And a lot of times people consider that some of the source for the pain is actually that motion. So by taking away that motion and stabilizing it, you should be able to reduce that pain. This model is the cages placed bilaterally. The ideal way is to be able to put two cages in. We are approved for one case. We do not compromise on fatigue strength, and it is not uh, considered off-label use. In about 5% of the cases, you're not able to anatomically put two of them in. So we do have it where we are approved for that. The other thing I have with the other implants. <laughs> I also brought a couple sample implants so you can take a look at those. And I will pass around the bone model. We also have gone to kind of the, the next generation page called proximity and we received our approval for that in October of 97. This case you can see is a little bit different, a little more porous for that bone growth going through and what this allows for is even more reduced exposure and you can place it closer together. But I'm going to pass around. Implants come different sizes. You go by when you're in on the patient you can take a look and you can place. That's what's in there, Leslie. <laughs> From the insurance perspective and the work comp perspective, in the FDA study, 59% of the patients were actually work comp. So there was a work comp comparison in there. And the return to work rate, I heard somebody ask, you know, what level are they going back to? Is it just sedentary work that you can expect? Again, that's patient specific. You need to know what was their condition prior to surgery. What was their activity level? What do they do post-op to help themselves as well? Uh, are they a good candidate to go back to it? Are they going to follow through with their activity levels and exercises? Another question that comes up quite a bit is post-op therapy. There is no real specific protocol because it really, again, is patient-specific. Um, there's one doctor that I have worked with in Kansas City, and he was pretty aggressive with that return. He had one patient uh, in a work hardening at six weeks. The patient called him and said he's never worked that hard at work and asked to go back and get out of the work hardening program. So, <laughs> <laughs> I actually presented with that patient and he said, that was the worst thing I'd ever been through. It was worse than the surgery. So it really depends. I'm actually working with an OT and PT group in Minneapolis to try to do some protocol, compare them, see how quickly they can get them up and get them moving and what specifically they need in terms of post-op therapy. Dr. Freed, do you have a standard protocol that you follow post-op with your therapy? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, we have a standard protocol of the entire post-op care, from the time they both wake up as far as medication, their catheters, and all that. In the hospital, they, they see the therapist once, um, help them get out of bed, walk with the walker, 
And then I just, again, very much take her attendant after that. I have not been aggressive to physical therapy until she's confused. And I think the best therapy is walking, encouraging them to walk. And not do a lot of other things unless they're some of the patients who are bodybuilders and that they work out with dumbbells. Uh, I've not done a lot. Unless you're going to go back to a, a heavy uh, foot core, and that has to be pretty much I've seen that work hard. Again, like I said, it's really patient-specific, doctor-specific, occupation. What's your overall goal? You know, that's what you need to take a look at. What, what are the patient's expectations? What point do you need to get to? And what level of activity? As far as some of the activities the patient can resume, um, like Dr. Free said, walking. There are patients that are running. There are patients. I had one he's going to see on the next patient guide. He shoots pool, and within about six weeks of his surgery, won a state tournament. And he said, but don't tell my doctor. I didn't tell my doctor. I shoot pool in that place. <laughs> and he actually was out deer hunting and fell 15 feet from a tree stand. He You're said, you know, Mary, must be pretty strong. Nothing happened after that. So, <laughs> and obviously I'm not out here to advocate, you know, stressing it to the limit. But pain function, that was really, that's what brought me. That's what the critical factor is. Like I said, from the work comp standpoint, what I really noticed was a quicker return to work and quicker function. And then in turn, you have the reduced cost because the post-op disability pay is that much less. And the medical stationary status, the point of getting them to MMI is much quicker. Are there any questions for me from the clinical standpoint, FEA, cost comparison? What I'm going to do now, the proof of the pudding is really in the patient. That's, that's where it's at. And I'm going to have Dr. Free introduce a patient. <laughs>
hours of surgery, four months of a body cast, two months of a body brace, but this time he put in two steel rods. Dr. Silverman told me, Leslie, you are not as indestructible as I thought you were. <laughs> we are going to have to do something. You need a sit-down job. You need something where you don't ever have to get up. Can you work from home, from bed? I don't know why he didn't trust me. I can't imagine why Dr. Silverman would not trust me. But we did what we had to do put the two rods in my spine, I came out of the body cast, I came out of the body brace, I was free, and I was fine, I was recuperating, I was doing great. I had dates again. <laughs> I had an apartment. I had a phone. I had it all. Until 1996. My husband and I on a New Year's Eve were sitting on the couch with the lights down, the candles flickering, the music playing softly in the background. Very romantic night. And I offered to get up, go to the kitchen, get that bottle of champagne so we can pop it to celebrate the New Year. When I took a few steps, and fell, collapsed, and he had to take him into the bed. You know, this isn't the plan I had <laughs> to land in bed that night. But with pain in my eyes, pain in my heart, pain in my back, he got me to a situation where I could just lay there and do nothing but act. Why me? I don't do anything wrong. I don't rob people. I don't even cut anybody off in traffic. I use my turn signal. <laughs> How many people use their turn signal? I use my turn signal. That's how I get places accident free. Because I'm safer in the car than I am walking. <laughs> I had so much pain, when I sneezed, I clapped. When I did the dishes, I had to hold on to the counter. When I would brush my teeth, I had to use a cup. These are things that we take for granted. Nobody ever thinks that they're going to collapse from sneezing, do we? We all think that, okay, well, I sneeze, fine. Nothing will happen. My back was just in pain. It's almost as if you have a headache and it's banging and banging and banging and it just won't go away. That's exactly how I felt day in and day out. I went to doctor after doctor after doctor and they all told me the same thing. They said, Leslie, I'm sorry, there's nothing that can be done. Until 1997, as I stand before you, I'm going to answer that question of why me. 1997, I was fortunate enough to meet Dr. Perry. Why was I fortunate enough to meet Dr. Perry? Because Dr. Perry had been the only doctor that could do what he did make me pain free. I am pain free. I can play tennis. Although I haven't yet. I know I can play tennis. I can jog and I haven't done that yet. But I am allowed to walk and I go to the mall quite frequently. I walked into Dr. Free's office and I said, Dr. Free, I can't take this anymore. I can't take this pain. What can be done? And he looked at my x-rays and he explained to me, he said, Leslie, what you have is called degenerative disc syndrome. Picture yourself, picture a car with brake pads that have been 
worn, where the pads have been worn down, and it's just metal rubbing up against metal. That's what you have. It's going to require surgery to straighten that out, but it's going to require only two days in the hospital. Two and a half hour surgery, a three month body break. And I'm thinking to myself, could this be possible? I have been through a 16 hour surgery, a 13 hour surgery. I have been through an eight month body cast, a four month body brace, bun bath. And here I can get into this brace that I can just take off when I want to jump into the shower. This can't be true. This cannot be true. There is no way but I believed, and I trusted, so I trusted the one doctor who was able to make my dreams come true, make me pain free. He explained to me who was going to help out with the resources. It was called a company named Spine Tech. Spine Tech made it possible to get in there, for him to get in there, and do what we had to do to make me pain free. If it had not been for spine tech, Dr. Faree would not have been able to do that surgery and I would not be able to walk pain free. I feel great. I went back to work almost immediately after I found a job. <laughs> Being a college graduate, it's very hard to find a job in these days. But I found a job and I went to work. Technically, I could be on disability. But I am a tax paying citizen. I feel good about myself. I love getting up in the morning. I love getting in the shower. I love getting my clothes on. I love getting in the car. And I love driving to my job and working eight hours, all because of one doctor and one manufacturer. I believe in the doctor. I believe in my husband. I believe in my parents. So with full support, my husband, my parents, my friends, my siblings, everybody says, Leslie, do it. Let Dr. Faree do what no other doctor can do. Let him make you pain free. Believe in him, believe in spine tech, but most of all, believe in yourself. So I said, Dr. Faree, do what has to be done. I want to walk. I feel great. I love life. I love the fact that my life has turned out to be something that I'm able to get up every morning and go to work. I believe in myself and therefore I believe in Dr. Faree and Spontech. Thank you.
anybody have any questions or comments or they need anything from me or Dr. Grace, please ask us at this time. There's plenty of food back there. I'm going to have a big doggy bag, so <laughs> help yourself. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, we are very happy with the turnout that we've gotten from everybody, and it's my intention to hopefully put on another program like this sometime later in the year. So if you would please go back to your colleagues and friends and patients and let them know that we're here to continually teach and educate not only the case manager personnel, but the, the OR emerging personnel. And a lot of these techniques which we are finding out, people know very little about. As you can see from Leslie's uh, story there, there's, there's quite a story to tell. So keep that in mind. Again, we're going to probably do this sometime, maybe late summer in the fall. Uh, if there's interest, I would think there is. There's a lot of people out there who, who need this. A good thing to do. So uh, you may hear from me again. And, uh, thank you again for coming. Drive home safely. And if you please forward your evaluation form to the center. We'll collect them when you're finished. Thank you. Thank you.
pound hammer in the 21st century. Yep. Here. 